Good morning. So now it mic is on. So this is an APOPS two. APOPS is a technical and operational uh, session during the apricot. Um, still, we have a um, uh, uh, live stream issue right now, but uh, as we have a record over there, uh, we can push in, uh, our content uh, uh, to YouTube later on. So let's make a start because it's um, uh, nine thirty. Uh, first up, uh, Jeff Houston. Uh, talking about the usual topic, BGP. Um, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Houston and for those of you who have attended Apricots in the past, this talk, at least by its title, will not be a surprise. Um, by content I think it is, things are changing. When you, God, screens. When you try and look at all of the internet, it's hard. I'm like, the internet's a really, really big place, really big. And your little neck of the woods, wherever that might be, is a tiny view. Trying to generalise from that tiny view to everyone is actually quite challenging. And for most folk, most views of you are warped, twisted and biased in all kinds of odd ways. And trying to understand the generality is actually challenging to get over this fact of me and everything else. But one of the few tools out there that brings the internet to you is routing. Because the job of routing is actually to bring the entire topology and reachability of everything to every default free speaker of the routing protocol. So BGP is one of those classic protocols where its job is to map the entire internet back to you, back to the observer. And so with some caveats, everyone's view of the global routing space is more uniform than my view of the network as me as a single user. The routing sort of space does try and collapse it all down into a single view. So Today, in the next oh, uh, 24 minutes, I will try and give you a view of what's happening in V4, V6, some projections about how big this is going to get in the coming years, which if you actually operate hardware that does high speed, and I mean high, high speed line forwarding, the most expensive memory in your box is actually FIB based uh, lookup memory to figure out where to route a packet, how big the FIB is, that decision table, affects an awful lot about how much money you're going to spend on hardware. Um, some things about churn and considerations, and let's get right into it. There are two astonishingly good projects out there uh, that try and collect the BGP views from many, many, many places. One of them is RIPE's RIS, the Route Information Service, and the other one is slightly more long-standing uh, that I rely on heavily, which is the University of Oregon's Route Views Project, which is the backbone of a whole bunch of these slides here. Um, so this is a very, very busy slide because each dot represents one peer of RIS or route views, one BGP speaker in about an eight hour window. So there are three samples per day going back since, well, the earliest data is around 1994 and you'll notice there are more folk who actually join in over the, over the ensuing period. And, <sighs> you start to see some of the major socioeconomic effects in that graph. Uh, in 1994, sorry, let me get this right. There's a laser pointer. I'm pointing right down at the bottom left. This is when everyone thought, oh my God, the internet's exploded. We cannot put all the routing table into our hardware. We're all going to die a horrible death. Um, and then classless interdomain routing, CIDR was introduced and it was kind of few disaster averted, and you kind of think in the grand scheme of things, <laughs> nothing happened. Um, it really wasn't a big an issue as we thought. Um, there you see the great internet boom and bust, and again, minor blip, absolutely minor blip. That explosion of, you know, everything's on the internet, it's new, it's wonderful, it's fantastic, and then everyone goes, oh, my dreams of becoming a squillionaire have been dashed, uh, appears in that sort of period around 2000, 2001. But then comes the rollout, because the leading 2% are nothing compared to the trailing 90%. Uh, 
And across the year, the 2000s, the noughties, this thing became a consumer product. We ditched fuzzy dial-ups and all that kind of nonsense because that was just torture. People didn't do that. DSL, the always on model, the internet is a utility that you plugged into from the wall. It just worked, it was always there. It was actually what captured the market. And you see this inexorable rise in the routing space as we simply geared to roll it out. Why isn't it a step function? Because oddly enough, you're not looking at demand, you're looking at effectively the amassing and orchestration of resources to meet demand. Every single player through that period, what they built got used. Demand outstripped supply, and this is really the supply side trying to organise itself to meet that demand. And that was a slow, steady, inexorable rise. Now, fascinatingly in this graph, a key thing happened in February 2011, where the IANA, the holder of the, if you will, reserve pools of addresses, handed out its last slash eight blocks into the RIR system, handed them out. This was the first signal of exhaustion. Did the industry know, care, or do anything? God, no. <laughs> exhaustion? What exhaustion? And just kept on gaily distributing, deploying, and growing the V4 network. And as the RIRs depleted themselves across that ensuing period from 2011 through to around 2018, 2020, when the screws were turned on really tightly, nothing happened. Deployment models in, in the sort of the routing space just grew. And it's only really in the last 24 months or so that the picture has changed. Here's V4 in 2023 by the size of the routing table. We're running on empty, running on empty, yet it's still growing to some extent, which is bizarre. Um, we've got out the chopper and we're slicing and dicing. The average address range in each routing advertisement is getting smaller. The number of FIB entries is growing. What about that big discontinuity? Uh, thank you, Turkey. Um, they withdrew around 7,000 routes overnight. There it is. Um, they want more specifics. But hang on a second. Why did they think it was reasonable to withdraw more specifics? Now, we use BGP and routing for two things, basic connectivity and traffic engineering. And if you have a rich set of connectivity, multiple circuits, none of them are big enough to handle all your load. So it's pretty typical that you advertise more specifics down particular circuits to try and balance that load, to try and engineer the traffic such that at no point do you get a single thing that's totally congested while there's available bandwidth elsewhere. Turkey withdrew them. Why? because the bulk of their consumer traffic is no longer being imported. It's coming from the local data centres. It makes no difference anymore. So withdrawing the more specifics makes no difference to the quality of the service they're operating to consumers. For them, the internet is now shrinking inside those ASs to data centres that are in country and probably inside their network itself because TT Telecom, TT Net is a very big provider in Turkey. So the withdrawal was kind of, doesn't matter anymore, not using it for traffic engineering. So that kind of brings in a more general idea of who's dropping prefixes last year. Turkey did, Ukrainians did, Sprintlink. Now you could say, well, Sprintlink's dying anyway, but that might be a bit unfair, but nevertheless they did. Um, one of the other big retail providers, CenturyLink. Um, and you can see the list as, as well as I can, but folk are dropping. Who's growing? Well, Amazon is growing, uh, Vietnam is growing, but the other areas of growth are not frenetically high. They're not really high. So it's an interesting kind of view of the FIB count, but let's move on a bit now, because I actually want to show a different metric. This is the amount of address space in total, the span. And now you see a completely different story that in essence, the great boom and bust didn't mean anything. The consumer market did, but the onset of address exhaustion really did impact the way we build, it, build networks. 
Because at that point, what we're advertising was close to the real thing. There was a minor rush to get addresses in that period before Iana died and a bit after, but then as it plateaued off, there's been no new addresses in the routing system. What about over here? US Department of Defence, enough said. Um, the other thing you also notice is there's an awful lot of noise in addressing span, an awful lot, because a whole bunch of peers of route views and risk don't actually send their complete tables, they just send subviews. So the major thing is the fault running default free, the rest is kind of little bits of subsets. So an entirely different view of where growth is. Let's advance the slide forward. Please advance the slide forward. Help. Someone press forward. I'm trying. There we go. So I'm going to look at 2023. I'll go backwards by one to see this is the one. This is the first slide I've ever shown of this dimension. This is no longer up and to the right, it's down and to the right. This is, yes, the S word, saturation. Have we reached that point where the market is actually fully saturated? Because if you look at the amount of address span across 2023, it's not growing, it fell. And it fell a lot. And the only reason why it didn't fall sort of monotonically is dear old Amazon, who is still going with a model that says every customer needs a new address, God knows why, um, decided to, to bump in a whole bunch of addresses into their plant. But it's falling. The address space is actually falling in terms of advertised address man. Now we get to this slide. If we take the zero point at the start of the year, the red line is the total size of unadvertised addresses. And over the year, it grew by 18 million addresses. A net of 18 million addresses got taken out of the routing system and actually stashed into somewhere else that we can't see. And you see the blue line, which is the advertised space, also, if you will, fell by the same amount. Amazon is there in the middle with that jump function. Um, but basically, we are removing addresses, not using more. The unadvertised pool is not falling, it is growing. The RIRs, nothing happened. They're exhausted, there's nothing left, there's nothing new to give out, so the green line, which is RIR allocations, is basically steady across the entire 12 months. So no net recovery, 18 million addresses got withdrawn. Bigger view, bigger view, kind of suggests that that thing started the uh, falling of unadvertised at around 2020, in the middle of COVID, or the early parts. And at that point, the IPv4 network simply stopped growing and started to shrink, and shrink a lot. The big step function there in 2021, DOD slash eights, they just decided to advertise some stuff that had never been advertised before, not really important. Who's pulling addresses out? Well, we mentioned Sprintlink. China, Lucent, AT&T, relatively big. Uh, there's our friends in Turkey. Akamai, one of the hyperscalers, is actually advertising fewer addresses, as is Google, as is Comcast. They're not growing in terms of addresses. In terms of addresses, they're getting smaller. Uh, you see on the right, the folk are actually growing. Need I say more? You can read as well as I can. There, you've had enough time. Hope you, hope you studied it. Uh, the summary of what I said, things are slowing down. Um, we could have peaked. We could have actually reached a point where the V4 network has got to about as big as it's going to get the advertised span has actually declined slowly over the year, and we may have got to that point where the V4 network is as big as it'll ever get. The numbers certainly seem to say so, whether you know, the behaviour of the industry says it as well, but we seem to have stopped at about a million FIB entries, and we seem to have stopped at around three billion or so advertised addresses. Okay, so you're all meant to be running V6, aren't you? Yes, Jeff, here we are. We're all meant to be running V6. And here you see the first kind of, oh yes, well it's right, it's up and to the right, it's strongly exponential. V6 is taking off, really, isn't it? Again, let's look behind that number, because it looks good, but it's just quite not, the, not as what you think. Um, there's 2023 compared to the long trend. Long trend, 2023. Not exactly vertical not exactly highly sloped. It's not going down, it's not, but the number of FIB entries is growing slightly. Growth is not 
momentous, and in fact, tailing off in the last third of the year, it's actually plateauing out. Again, the S word, saturation. Because what it seems to be is, you know, there were some step functions in Vietnam and one in Hong Kong, but beyond that, the amount of growth, look at those last two months, meh. The amount of new activity and new deployment in V6 is actually trailing off. So what's fueling that growth? More, more, more consumers, more customers, or something else? For a long time, V6 was never used for traffic engineering. For a long time, V6 was a disused orphan child of V4. No one gave it any attention and whether it actually worked or failed made no difference because, you know, happy eyeballs. As long as V4 worked, the network was working. But over, in fact, since about 2017, folks started taking V6 slightly more seriously and started to use it for traffic engineering. How do we know that? Because you started advertising slash 48s as more specifics. So all of a sudden, you're trying to balance the traffic in V6 over more specifics. And now the number of more specifics in V6 is close to 60% of the entire block of you know, routing. So it's just littered with slash 48s. How sustainable is this? How many slash 48s are there in V6? Well, you know, a lot, <laughs> a huge amount. More than your router could possibly ever cope for in the next decade or two? Well, yes. This is crazy. You can't put a cap on this if that's the way you wanna go because there are more 48s than you can possibly handle. But V6 is kind of going there, pumping the network full of slash 48s. Here's a different picture, advertised address span. Just to remind you, let's flip the charts again. Number of routing entries up and to the right. Address span, uh, more constrained. The real growth factors are actually much, 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 much lower. They're gentler. They actually reflect a much more reluctant industry to actually embrace V6. And, and look at 2023 in advertised addresses. Flat. Well, I wouldn't say completely flat, but the growth is really, really small. There's not an awful lot of activity in expanding that network in terms of its address span. What we have at the start of the year is largely what we got at the end of the year. So we grew by 30,000 entries, yay, but the growth was really in slash 48s. It wasn't in more addresses, more connectivity. 1.6% um, of growth. The world population grew by 3%. Hmm. So in actual fact, it's losing pace. Um, so it's much, much lower than even the previous four or five years. Again, the S word. So let's go to some projections. If you're buying a piece of equipment now, you've got about, I don't know, five years of useful life out there in the field. How big do you need to get five years of growth in the size of the routing table? V4, this is the first time the numbers, just a straight mathematical model, using an order two polynomial, tend to suggest we have peaked at a million, slightly under. And the numbers suggest it's going down. Now, these are just numbers. What you do with your customers and your routers, I have no idea. And it may go either way. But the last five years numbers suggest that the growth not only is going down, but it's going to go negative. And the peaking point is around about now, give or take a year or two. And then the numbers suggest it will actually start to fall. The folk who are withdrawing will outnumber the folk who are growing. Never done that graph before with a downward, never. It's always been, oh, well, it's linear. Oh, the linear slope is low. Now it's kind of, no, it tipped over. These, uh, so yeah, V6, a few years ago, the exponential trend looked pretty solid. Now it doesn't. Even a polynomial is flattening out to look a lot like linear. The best projection is kind of a linear growth model that is very, very gentle growth in V6. So in actual fact, all of these trends tend to suggest that the actual market demand for this stuff is close to peaking. And instead of growing in the address space, we're growing in different areas. Hint, it's the namespace. So, you know, it looks like we are plateauing out even in six. Um, one year from now, 
you will devote as much sp space in your high-speed memory to V4 and V6 because V6 tables are four times bigger in general. So at that point, V6 will have got to 25% of V4. And the real good news in all of this, VGP will see us to our collective death. <laughs> there is no reason to suspect that VGP is under astronomical pressure. You don't need to change anything at all. Um, BGP is coping and will look like it will continue to cope across all of these numbers. Um, but it's not quite how big it is, it's also how much thrashing, because BGP is a distance vector protocol and that's one of the least efficient protocols known to man. It works really well, but it's highly inefficient. It works by exhaustive search. And that exhaustive search and your bigger network can get phenomenally difficult. The yellow line, the growth of the network in V4. The blue line from where I sit in my router at the edge of my network, it's a me picture, is the number of updates I see per day. In a standard distance vector routing protocol, if noise was kind of randomly distributed, the blue line would rise either equal to the yellow line or even at a greater rate as a square because it's distance vector. It didn't. It's actually risen gently, and in the last year or so, the number of updates has actually plateaued out. It's actually now quite slight at around, you know, um, 200,000 updates a day from where I sit. What's the problem, guys? What's wrong with updates? Why do you limit them? And look at the bottom line, which is the number of withdrawals. Apart from a hiccup, oops, uh, at the start of uh, 2023, the number of withdrawals has been astonishingly stable. I want to withdraw a route. No, it's not your turn. Wait. I'm only allowed 10,000 withdrawals a day and you're not in the quota. Somehow, some way, the dynamic behaviour of this routing protocol is limiting itself, even though there's no agreement with operators, there's no overlying control factor, the system is actually capped. It's a self-limiting system without any governing constraint being applied externally. Uh, one of today's modern technical miracles. God knows how you do it, I certainly don't. Um, so surprisingly stable, whoopee doo. Uh, the number of unstable prefixes, the naughty corner down the end there, phenomenally stable. I want to update my prefix. No, you're not allowed because only these number of prefixes, only this set are allowed to update. So most of the network, most of the network for the last 20 odd years, does nothing in BGP, just nothing. You announce the network, yawn, nothing changes. Phenomenally stable. Unst instability is highly concentrated in a bunch of folk who don't know what they're doing. And those folk are incredibly naughty. Yeah, the two leaving the room. Um, incredibly naughty. <laughs> and everything else is actually phenomenally stable. This is great because this is what keeps BGP alive. So slowly increasing, almost imperceptibly. V4, convergence times. If you change your routing within approximately 49 seconds, which is two MRI intervals, two minimum route advertising intervals, the world will see it. And that was true back in 2014. It is true today. The network has grown phenomenally, but it's the same timer. Because the network is not getting less efficient. Performance is not getting worse. Performance is constant because the underlying topology, oddly enough, is roughly constant. This is, again, amazing. There's nothing deliberate. It's nothing in the protocol. The way you've built this network has these properties. So highly stable. V6 updates, completely wrong. You guys don't know what you're doing or you just don't care or you're not looking, or all three, because the number of updates is roughly equal to the size of the table. The number of withdrawals is growing. This stuff is all over the floor. It is not contained. Whatever you're doing in V4, you're not doing in V6. You're just not, you're just not looking. So these things that we're seeing in V4, I think are the result, you actually give it some time and attention. It's what you're getting paid to do. No one's paying you to look after V6. You don't care. It works like crap. And it is crap. Um, growth trajectory is high. Unstable prefix is growing. So it's not just the naughty corner, it's the naughty half the room. And, and as the room gets bigger, the naughty half the room gets bigger. 
They just keep on growing. You're not looking, you don't care. So you say to everyone, you must run V6. Why? Because we're not looking after it and performance is lousy. Okay, great deal. Why do you hate your customers? Run V4, it actually works better in this sense. Convergence performance was horrible for years. All those overlays, let's run V6 over tunnels, bad idea. It's slowly getting to a convergence performance in the last year that looks a lot like V4, but it's taken almost 20 years to get to that point. So that's kind of good. Updates. This is the cumulative distribution. If everyone did updates, it'd be right on the diagonal. If only a few very, very naughty people did almost all the updates, green, V6, only a small number of folk would actually be contributing to the entire set of noise in V6. And that's what's going on, that V6, a small number of people are pathologically unstable and they just pound the entire network with a huge number of updates. If they stopped, you might actually find the network is far more stable. But yes, at the moment, two ASs, 50% of the V6 updates, we thank you very much. Um, conclusions, because I'm running out of time. Uh, BGP is fine. BGP is fine. If you want to develop a new interdomain routing protocol, feel free, but no one's interested in what you're doing. Um, <laughs> that expansion is over. The driver of growth is over. Everything's moving up in the protocol stack. Infrastructure is now stable, moribund and saturated. The world is in the application world. The world is in CDNs and applications. The underlying plant in the addressing and routing factory is kind of, we're built enough. Whatever it is we're built enough of, it's not growing. Um, but there are a few things you need to know, Optus. And you need to know the size of your fib table, Optus. And you need to understand that when it gets over a million, Optus, um, one of these things might trip over the max prefix link limit and you might find your national network is completely isolated, Optus, from your engineering support group in another country. Oops, Optus. Um, it was just sitting there waiting for a million and a million came and it went bing. And it was kind of, the entire network was cut off. A few million Australians couldn't even have the emergency of what we do, the triple O number. Thank you indeed. Look at that number. Don't ignore it. It's an important number. And by the way, when you exceed it, don't shut down the session. That's really dumb. Freeze your fib table and alarm like crazy, but do not, just do not shut down the session. Because Optus, it will happen to you and your CEO will have to fall on, on her collective sword, as I think the CTO and some others. Because, you know, that's an important line. Understand the limit and understand what happens when you exceed it. Um, Optus, <laughs> other than poking fun at them, most others have actually survived this. Do have a look at your settings in the fib table. It is important. It is important because they are growing. And don't forget V6 is four, four times bigger than V4. Default routes can be really, really, really helpful. You don't have to carry all the tables unless you feel like doing it and you know have nothing to do on a Wednesday afternoon. Run default. Um, and quite frankly, there are a number of vendors experimenting with various forms of fib compression. Interesting. Although one of them has just been bought by HP, so who knows what will happen to that. And hot caching also gets you out of the bind of having to do the world's most expensive memory to hold a million 32-bit entries and 250,000 128-bit entries, all to handle traffic that only goes to 50 destinations if you're lucky. If you did hot caching in those fib cards, you'd get away with about, well, 50 bytes of memory if you did hot caching. Um, so you don't have to solve everybody's problem at absolute line rate. You can be selective and that will be cheaper. So, you know, if you're doing that, that's a really good thing. I've run out of time. Is there any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, do you have any questions? Maybe I can take one. Yes. Cool. Yes. Oh, there is one. Please. Sorry, Barry. <laughs> I was running away. Yeah, please state your name. <laughs> Barry Green, uh, with Shadow Server right now. So, Jeff, um, updates. What if we times 100 all on one day from 300 devices across the internet with BGP withdrawals as the sessions flap up and down? What if you massively increase the updates from one source? No. 300 sources. And they all started chattering away with BGP updates. Right. 
up and down, up and down, up and down sessions, up and down, up and down, up and down. We have, we have close to 400,000 BGP sessions out there because we're thinking so much about, oh, let's go sign our routes, but we're not doing anything to protect the sessions. And every now and then the bad guys are poking at it. So state actors understand how to do this. You know, <laughs> we occasionally put out advisories going, route flap damping is really good. And then the pendulum swings and we put out these sort of informal views going, route flap damping is a waste of everyone's time. What's the problem? And then you go, well, route flap damping is really good. And, and the real answer is, it depends on when you ask the question whether route flap damping is good and protects us from things like this, or just an administrative waste of time that routes get put in a sin bin for no real reason. Mm -hmm. um, but there is route flap damping for situations exactly like that. Right. In the grander scheme of things, in today's world, I think we're relatively laissez-faire about routing. Route flap damping is too much work, I don't care. But that's today's view. Come back in two years' time, the pendulum will have swung. Must do route flap damping. You know, so yeah, we have the tools, but not everyone deploys it all of the time. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, we have next up um, Doug Madri uh, from Kentic. Uh, he will share some BGP incident. Yeah, we have. Mary. Hello. All right. So you have a, a clicker and then you receive over there. Okay. And that's right coming, I think. All right. Thanks for having me. My name is Doug Midori. This is my talk, a uh, brief history of uh, the Internet's big, biggest BGP incidents. So let's get started. Whoops. Yeah. So this talk comes from uh, uh, some work I did with uh, this organization called BTAG, which is an re um, re organization that represents the broadband providers in the United States who were responding to a, uh, a request from uh, the FCC, that's our federal agency that oversees communications in the US. Uh, they, were, they got an interest a couple of years ago into BGP and what they needed to do to try to foster secure uh, internet routing in the United States. And uh, so I was part of this group of uh, a couple dozen uh, notable experts in BGP that wrote up this report. I recommend uh, the, the, the report. The section I was mostly responsible for was looking at uh, this, the history of what, if, if someone were new to the topic, what would be the big incidents to, to be aware of to try to uh, fill out the problem space? Uh, the because basically because I had been writing about this for you know now going on about 15 years of writing these these incidents, so I published on my own uh, on the Kentic blog you know a, a, another version of this uh, this history uh, it got republished and translated, and so this this talk is a mini version of uh, that brief history and I'll try to get through it um, today, so. Why don't we take a stroll through a BGP incidents and understand you know, why are these problematic? So we have either uh, incidents that are disruptive to uh, legitimate traffic or incidents where there's some concern around traffic getting misdirected and perhaps intercepted, surveilled. And there's uh, typically incidents fall into one of these two categories. People can make a case that some maybe fall into both. Um, but uh, when I try to talk about the problem space around uh, BGP security, I try to explain that this is a this is not like a one you know one one type thing. This is a constellation of problems and uh, of a variety of different things we're trying to address here, and they sit on a spectrum of some that are kind of easy or uh, or you know embarrassingly uh, mistakes that that take out uh, internet communications on up to things that are legitimately difficult to solve. And when I first started working in this space and started writing about routing leaks and hijacks and those kind of incidents, you know, we really weren't very good at solving anything on this spectrum. And I'm here to say that that's not the case anymore. There's been some progress. So let's start with routing leaks. <clears throat> so there's this RFC 7908 that defines uh, a route leak uh, as the propagation of routing announcements beyond their intended scope. It's a very um, elegant and concise uh, synopsis of what, what is a, a routing leak. Uh, now in that RFC, it goes on to define, kind of create a taxonomy of a variety of uh, different types of scenarios of route leaks. For me, uh, I like to just use two buckets 
uh, of things that are misoriginated, uh, leaks that are uh, misoriginations, and then adjacency leaks where you've got routes coming in from one side that are you know, getting egressed out a way they shouldn't. Uh, the reason this is useful for me is because we have different mitigation strategies for these two different uh, uh, categories, and those, those are useful to me. So uh, let's go through origin leaks. So this begins with an incident uh, way back in April 1997, before my time in the industry, uh, where there was a, a, a routing leak uh, due to a software bug that caused a router to disaggregate uh, all of its, uh, um, all the routes in the routing table to slash 24s, announce these out to the internet, and uh, obviously bad things ensue. Uh, the, the network was knocked offline. One thing that was you know, unique about this in the state uh, at this time, according to the folks uh, that I know that were uh, around it then, is that this bug was so bad that once they isolated the problematic router, uh, a lot of these announcements were still in circulation and required manual intervention to, to, uh, to completely clear this out. So uh, that's a, uh, an issue we don't see so much anymore. But you know, there have been a number of routing uh, of origination leaks uh, in, the, in the suing years, although I would argue we don't see them so much anymore, and that's not by accident. But you know, the, the list, the pantheon of big events here, of Turk Telecom showed up in, uh, uh, Jeff slides uh, a few minutes ago with this China Telecom leak that got a lot of people um, agitated in the U.S. Uh, in 2010, a Telecom Malaysia leak. This graphic on the right is from a, a, a talk I gave uh, in RIPE and Nanog about I don't know four or five years ago, looking at uh, just the propagation of, of of the routes within a leak. We we use the term like oh 50,000 routes. Well, not all of them had the same amount of uh, disruption. The, the supposition is that a, a route that propagates, a bad route that propagates farther has the potential to do more damage, and those that don't go anywhere probably didn't do that much. Uh, and in this case, if we were to uh, apply that uh, analysis to some of these events, in this case, it was really a China-on-China a China incident. Uh, those were the leaks that were, uh, the routes that were most affected. But um, so that, so there's, those are the, you know, a, a couple of the origination leaks. And then we've got this kind of, you know, subcategory of uh, leaked hijacks. And so these are things that are both a particle and a wave. They're intentional, but also accidental. Uh, and the most famous one is this Pakistan incident that I'm sure most people are aware of. What is, um, uh, but this is, this is something that we continue to see uh, uh, ongoing even to the, in the past year of um, routes that are intended to be uh, blocking traffic locally that leak out. So what's interesting is to look at this incident with this particular one slash 24 belonging to Twitter or X uh, that uh, suffered a couple of hijacks. Uh, one was during the, uh, the, um, the aftermath of the military coup in Myanmar here next door. Uh, where there was a crackdown on social media. Uh, the government ordered ISPs to drop traffic. One of those uh, networks elected to do this via BGP, a lot like PTCL did to YouTube uh, many years ago. Uh, unfortunately, it leaked out, again, like uh, the, the Pakistan example, and disrupted uh, Twitter access for, in this region for a period of time. You know, one year later, uh, there was a similar incident where, again, in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russia had a crackdown on social media. One of the providers decided they were going to block Twitter by uh, announcing the same slash 24 almost a year to the day. It also leaked out. Uh, and so the, the circumstances were very similar, but the impact was very different. And what happened between these two incidents was that uh, our Twitter X had uh, they were still Twitter at the time, had uh, created ROAS for all their routes. And that enabled other ASs to see that this uh, uh, hijack route that was coming out of Russia was uh, illegitimate and uh, blocked it, dropped it, and the, the traffic impact uh, between these two is um, remarkably different. These are the types of successes that RPKI offers on a near daily basis that don't you know, they don't warrant blogs, they don't get a lot of press, but this is what success looks like of just, we're, we're trying to limit the, uh, uh, the bad routes, uh, the, how they propagate, this doesn't help the folks in Myanmar and Russia in this case, but um, uh, this, is, uh, this is a system working. In the case of, um, uh, adja now we move on to adjacency leaks. So here's a couple that are, are worth uh, considering. So we had this main one leak, uh, this main one is a big provider out of Nigeria, uh, one of the largest international gateways on the west coast of Africa. 
uh, basically took routes uh, from um, its peers and announced them to transit providers. It happened to be China Telecom, then passed this on to the uh, wider internet, and there was a, um, a lot of, again, agitation around that. To their credit, you know, they posted on social media within a couple hours, hey, this was our mistake, you know, everybody settled down. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, not, a, not, not even a year later, we had this Allegheny Tech uh, leak where you had a, a small network. Uh, one, of our, one of our providers was using a route optimizer, uh, so that was creating uh, a small set of more specifics that were intended to stay local and through this leak, leaked out onto the internet. What's interesting here is, you know, that the figure I have 29,000 routes, you know, the, that's, that's true the, uh, as far as how many routes were involved in the leak. It's really about 200 that were the ones that were problems because those are the ones that were more specifics. The rest of them were just uh, passed through, and those 200 were uh, for content. You know, just how how this route optimizer was working. It was trying to optimize traffic to content providers. Cloudflare was one that was uh, was probably the arguably the most impacted uh, content provider here. Um, what's interesting in that case is that had their um, had it was Verizon at the time that carried us on to the rest of the internet, had they been rejecting invalids, it probably wouldn't have been that big of a deal, but only because of the max prefix length uh, violation that the route optimizer would have uh, created. Because in this last bullet we see, this is what the paths look like. And so the origins were intact. So any kind of origin-based uh, mechanism is not gonna do anything for you here. We have to have something else and that's where that's part of the motivation for ASPA, where ASs would register what are their transit relationships that would enable other ASs to look at AS paths and figure out where are things like uh, valley-free violations and be able to uh, um, reject those routes. So that's uh, part of the motivation for um, uh, for ASPA, or, or maybe it's the main motivation. But the other, I guess, lesson learned there was that you know if you're going to set a max prefix length, either either have it match your, the, the route as routed or, uh, or don't use it as another option. So, you know, as someone who's in the space, so you read a lot of the coverage of this and sometimes you get these things of just like, oh, you know, it's all, uh, you know, this is a disaster. We have to replace BGP and, um, and it's, uh, you know, what a, what a mess this is. Uh, I, I kind of look at it the other way. It's kind of remarkable. We have this one instance of one routing protocol governing the entire internet, and it, and it actually works on a daily basis. Uh, so, um, yeah, we have you know bridging gap protocol came from the Facebook outage. You know, who knows where they got that from? I was like, oh, I swear that was not from me. <laughs> um, but you know, the question to ask yourself, uh, in my opinion, again from looking at this for almost uh, now 15 years, is uh, you know when was the last debilitating BGP leak? Well, it's been a while. Maybe it was the Allegheny Tech one. That's, you know, it's approaching five years ago. And uh, in internet time, that's a long time. Uh, this isn't by accident that this is, uh, this is getting uh, better. Our fingers, you know, are not getting less fat. Uh, mine certainly aren't. Uh, so let's talk about why, are, why maybe things are getting better. So one of the areas is RPKI, where we can measure uh, some of the progress that we've made. And uh, one, of the, one of the big achievements was getting these uh, you know, DFC uh, networks, the top tier one uh, to, uh, networks to drop invalids. Uh, there's an enormous amount of downstream benefit that comes from uh, them doing that. Uh, this graph comes from NIST. So this is, uh, I mentioned FCC earlier, and NIST is another federal agency. We have a lot of them. Uh, and this one, they've got a team there that studies uh, internet routing. Uh, and puts out a lot of great stuff. Uh, they have this website that publishes uh, you know, uh, daily updated stats uh, of a variety of um, types around RPKI. This graph, and I think it's easy, to, maybe you can read the yellow, is a little uh, faint, but uh, you know, through time you can see uh, the yellow line is how many routes in the V4 routing table have no ROA, they're unknown if, if they were to be evaluated, and then the green is valid. Well, there's an inflection point uh, a few years ago where these lines were kind of flat, and now they're moving in a, it's almost uncanny how straight these lines are, uh, but they're about to cross. We're uh, you know, just weeks away from the majority of the V4 routing table being valid and having um, uh, ROAs. Uh, for V6, that actually happened last year, so uh, they're ahead of the game. And then there's a, a line of um, uh, in persistently invalid stuff that hugs the x-axis. Uh, and so two years ago, I had a inside. I work at a company that does a lot of NetFlow analysis. We have a lot of uh, NetFlow data to, to look at. We also have a thing where we, uh, upon ingest of uh, records, we do a, a RPI evaluation of the destination IP. You know, would this have been gone? Would this traffic had gone to uh, something a route that was valid 
invalid, whatever. And um, at the time, what was the insight was that, you know, at the time we only had about one third of the uh, B2B routes had ROAs. But when we looked at traffic, it was majority. Um, when I just threw all of our customer data into a big pot and looked, and so the uh, the idea was that like we were maybe we're making you know we're more pro we're making we've made more progress than we uh, uh, than we knew, and part of this comes from major eyeball networks doing RPI deployments and content providers. These uh, networks may not account for the majority of routes, but they may account for a large share, or they do account for a large share, maybe majority of uh, of the traffic that we. Uh, that we pass. Now, if we take that, uh, we update that to now, like in that graph from uh, the previous slide where these things are about to cross, we're at like 50%, and now we're at like two thirds of traffic uh, in bits per second uh, going to routes with, that are valid. So, and I even looked at ties, uh, tie routes. So in uh, AFTAB session just a, a little while ago, uh, yesterday, uh, we looked at maybe 50% of the routes uh, uh, of the tie internet uh, have ROAs. And I don't know, from our perspective, when I ran the numbers, we're seeing 80% bits per second uh, going to uh, routes, tie routes with, uh, with ROAs. So um, we actually are maybe are making more progress here uh, as well than we would have expected. But the ROAs are uh, alone or useless if nobody's uh, rejecting invalids. Um, and so that's uh, measuring uh, who is rejecting invalids is a tricky thing. And there's been a, a number of attempts to try to answer this question. So my approach is the following. is to take uh, something like route views, a public BGP repository, take the whole table and evaluate all the routes, and then go back and look how many of the BGP sources saw each of the routes. So in this case, uh, let me walk through this graph here. Uh, the x-axis is how many BGP sources, so Route has got 300 and something. Uh, and there's, this, there's a highly conserved uh, um, peak around global, global routing uh, in you know, V4 and, uh, and, and V6. And those that are not found or unknown, those without ROAs, look a lot like valids. So these are both not getting filtered, so those peaks look very similar. But if you look at those persistently invalid routes that we saw in the NIST, uh, graph, though that the distribution has shifted way to the left, uh, meaning that the system is suppressing what, what it thinks are bad routes. Most of these are misconfigurations, but it's, it's keeping these things from propagating around. And you know, potentially, if these were uh, disruptive, then, then that this is, again, the system working. I challenge you to find a, uh, an RPI invalid route that is globally routed. Uh, you can't find one that's even seen by 50% or more of, a, of um, BGB sources in, a, in ripe RIS or route views. It just uh, it can't happen. And again, this is, uh, this is another way to measure you know, how far we've gone. If we get you know, Telecom Italia and Zio start uh, rejecting these uh, invalids as well, I, I would expect to see that distribution to shift even farther to the left, but um, this is progress. And if you don't believe me, there was this incident in Orange, España last month where uh, we had a hacker find, stumble upon the, uh, the login credentials to the Ripe NCC portal, uh, and they decided to log in and just kind of, this is a kind of an act of vandalism here, just to mess with uh, their account. And they knew enough to know, well, if I create some ROAs that, uh, that don't um, match how things are routed, then it'll trigger the, you know, our, our security system to essentially attack itself uh, this is kind of an autoimmune response here where um, uh, it would, you know, re we start rejecting these uh, routes. And so that's what ended up happening. Uh, there was no traffic that was misdirected despite some uh, poorly worded uh, news coverage. Uh, no data was compromised, but the, the networks became unreachable as a result of this. Um, I used uh, Joe Snyder's uh, route view, or sorry, RPI views uh, tool to go back in time and reconstruct, you know, the, the steps that this person took. It really were these four rows that were created that caused the most havoc. And this dip here in this graph in the bottom is the dip in propagation as that as a new uh, problematic row it gets propagated out through the internet, and we see a dip in um, uh, its propagate the propagation of the BGB route, not the ROA. Uh, and when these routes are not, you know, not available, then they can't communicate. So if you didn't believe, uh, this, this couldn't have happened if we didn't have a lot of uh, networks rejecting invalids. And I'd say that's not just RPKI, because some of that stuff is fairly, you know, recent uh, developments, I would say. And things that were improving even before uh, this recent uh, uh, stuff with uh, RPKI. And all of these problems can be solved with RPKI. I would just say that, in general, it's hard to put it, uh, to enumerate the issue, the, the, uh, all the different types of things that um, contributed to this. But there's a general improvement in route hygiene, I would argue. 
uh, and we have like IRR filtering, uh, just a higher level of expectation, um, a higher level of awareness. I'd like to think some of the stuff I've written over the years maybe contributed to that. Um, I would just point out also that uh, you know, for a few years there, China Telecom was kind of the boogeyman in this space. Uh, they were involved in a, a bunch of uh, leaks. I was the author of some of that stuff. Um, but you know, the, in 2020, they joined uh, Manners, committed to cleaning up uh, the routing. Um, and I, I, they're not, they do not appear in any leaks. Leaks still happen, uh, but they're not, uh, China Telecom is not involved. You know, I wrote this, uh, this tweet here. I was like, hey, congratulations. I'm looking forward to you know, this uh, benefiting everybody. I got a nice reply back. I assume they didn't like me, uh, but maybe, that's, uh, maybe, I, maybe I was wrong about that. But anyway, it's another uh, kind of unheralded uh, good news story here. Like another problem we don't seem to have uh, as much anymore. Um, again, this is some of the RPKI por uh, portion. Uh, I think the two takeaways I'd like people to have is that uh, you know, the majority of traffic, if we buy this analysis, the majority of traffic is directed to RPKI valid routes, that ought to be incentive for you to be rejecting uh, invalids for you, your network and your customers' net networks, because that's going to protect how you egress traffic. You're not going to get tricked by a, a leak, you're not gonna misdirect your traffic. So we talk a lot about some of this is beneficial for the broader internet, but you've got something to gain from that uh, as well. And then conversely, uh, because we're seeing uh, this route propagation drop by a half or more when a route uh, becomes invalid, that's incentive to create the ROAs so that the rest of the internet can, in an automated fashion, look out on your behalf like, uh, like the internet did for Twitter uh, when uh, this you know, one provider leaked out this hijacked route. That's the uh, motivation for RPKI. But obviously, the, everything I've been talking about so far has been um, uh, mostly accidental stuff or intentional plus accidental. Uh, obviously, we know that there's been some cases here that people have been intentionally gone after routing stuff. Here's a couple photos of people doing that. Um, uh, and so I'll just talk about um, a couple of incidents. We had, you know, this, I think in this space, we um, an important moment was this uh, Black Hat talk of uh, Bielosov Capella talking about uh, using BGP to do a man in the middle. Uh, a few years later, uh, uh, myself uh, and my colleagues at Renesis, we, we identified what we felt like was the first uh, man in the middle BGP attack found in the wild. We had routes coming out of, hijacks coming out of Belarus, targeting Visa and MasterCard and the various uh, governments over a span of uh, a few weeks using BGB communities to cleverly uh, shape the propagation to ensure the uh, man in the middle uh, would, would uh, be successful. Um, but these days, uh, the, the space where we see this is in uh, hijacks involved in sophisticated attacks targeting cryptocurrencies. I won't go through EtherWallet and ClaySwap, but those are also uh, important ones to, to understand. I'll just mention uh, a little bit about the Seller Bridge case. And honestly, there's more of these cases uh, going on uh, that uh, not, every, not all of these have been uh, public. But <clears throat> the Seller Bridge, this is a service to um, convert, current, convert between cryptocurrencies. Uh, the attacker picked the biggest kid in the playground to go after and didn't, was unfazed by going and uh, hijacking AWS stuff. You think of a company that probably has enough resources and wherewithal to defend themselves. Uh, these guys were un, undaunted. They knew they could get away with what they were gonna do. Uh, so why was this successful? For a couple reasons. For one, these guys were smart enough to know that they needed to get a, a, a data center that would announce these routes uh, and um, uh, announced routes that they would allow them to forge an AS path where they would be able to uh, trick uh, uh, and circumvent any ROV protection because the address space they're going after is going to have a ROA. They also needed to know that the upstream of that hosting provider had built uh, their automated uh, filtering based on IRR uh, data that they could inject a bad uh, route object into. So they were able to put this um, uh, object into AltDB, uh, this free RIR alternative, uh, and have that appear in Aurelion's uh, filtering that would allow Quick Host in the UK to announce AWS address space, something it shouldn't normally be able to do. And then they were forging AS paths, and these routes were getting uh, out into the, uh, uh, into the internet. So in this graph I put out um, at the time, you were like these four pulses where they were announcing and withdrawing, announcing, withdrawing uh, over the span of a couple of hours. During each of these, they're running their attacks and stealing uh, cryptocurrency. Eventually, AWS catches on, and they announce the same slash 24, but it's too late. The attack is already over. Um, 
And so in the, uh, in the aftermath of this, you know, like we, uh, I think it's important to understand, you know, we, when we talk about ARCHI-K ROV, this is not, this is something that's gonna help us most in those bonehead error uh, end of the spectrum. And it's gonna help us a little bit on the other side, but uh, this was uh, an actor that knew how to um, uh, step, step around that, uh, uh, that mechanism, and you know, my critique here was that these um, the ROAs they had created. Uh, uh, we got some pushback from AWS on this, but um, these are pretty liberal. You know, this is, these are uh, the ROAs allow routes in the ranges from slash ten to twenty four. Three different ASs could announce it, so that gave you know, I, in my opinion, the attacker a lot of room to work with to uh, manufacture something a route that would be uh, believable, would survive uh, the IR based filtering, the RPK ROV and enable them to do their, um, their attack. And uh, yeah, and in the end, we need something you know, like BGPSEC uh, to completely eliminate this uh, impersonation of ASs. Uh, obviously, there's, a lot of, there's lots of critiques around uh, BGPSEC, and we don't have to debate the whole thing here. One of those is that we've got, uh, it's, it's only as good as you know, this contiguous uh, set of um, BGP-aware ASs. I would make the case that in this um, in this scenario, that is not so such a problem because if if Aurelion and AWS were both BGPSEC aware, Aurelion would have preferred the route for the uh, route from AWS over uh, QuickHost that wouldn't be signed. So I think uh, that and that would have benefited the entire rest of the internet, even if the rest of the internet hadn't uh, was not BGPSEC aware. So I I would you know argue and you can debate me on this uh, uh, that there's benefits from partial deployment here as well. But like I said, we've made a bunch of progress. Uh, um, there's things we still need to do. We're working our way up that spectrum. Uh, we've got ASPA now uh, uh, getting rolled out that will help with those adjacency leaks uh, we talked about at the beginning. Uh, RPKI, I think, is uh, there's a lot of benefit, um, and I can give you uh, offline some more examples of where it's uh, where it's helping on a on a regular basis. And then we need you know some sort of a mechanism to uh, address this origin impersonation because that's going to um, uh, it's going to continue to cause us problems. And I, yeah, I guess I, I take a glass half full view of this that uh, in my almost 15 years of writing about this stuff, I'd say that we're, uh, the needle is moving in the right direction. This is just a really hard problem. We have to keep working at it. I uh, appreciate all the folks that uh, attend this conference that have been a part of the solution and trying to improve routing security uh, for your networks. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any uh, comments or uh, questions? Yeah, we had so many incidents. Thank no you worries. very much for sharing. Okay. Thank you very much. So, last but not least, we have uh, uh, Thomas uh, Holterbach. Uh, oh, yeah, he's coming. Uh, from University of uh, Strasbourg. Uh, uh, he will talk about... Um, Hijacks. Yes. <laughs> For the years. Such okay, can you hear me? Yes, I think it works. Um, so, hello everyone. I am Thomas Solterbach from the University of Strasbourg in France. And uh, today I will talk about uh, forged origin hijacks. Actually, the previous presentation was a great um, like, transition to this presentation because Doug mentioned some hijacks, some attacks that were actually successful and uh, they used forged origin hijacks. So, now I will show you how we can detect those hijacks. Uh, but let's start with a very simple example. We take a few autonomous systems that are connected using peer-to-peer -peer or customer-to-provider um, relationships, and then we assume that AS7 in green announces a prefix that it owns, 7 slash 8, so a BGP route will propagate through the network, and the other autonomous system will be able to reach that destination uh, using an ISPath, and the traffic is supposed to follow this ISPath. Okay. So now imagine that there is an attacker, AS5, who actually hijacks uh, this prefix, 7 slash 8. So the hijack route will propagate, and some of the autonomous system here, 1, 3, and 6, will divert the traffic to the attacker. Okay, so you probably know about BGP hijacks already. Uh, and you probably know that there are defenses against hijacks as well. So typically there are protocol extensions, such as APK plus LOV, BGP sec, ASPA, they were mentioned before. Uh, there are configuration guidelines, such as route filters, mentioned before as well. And there are monitoring platforms, such as Artemis and BGP Alerter, which can detect hijacks in near real time, okay? 
Um, the problem is that this is very useful, but today BGP is still vulnerable to forged origin hijacks. Okay, so what is a forged origin hijack? It's a hijack where the attacker prepends the valid origin in the AS pass. Okay, so from a BGP standpoint, the hijack route actually appear legitimate. Okay. So here, for instance, this is what happens in this case. IS-5, the attacker prepends 7, the legitimate autonomous system here, and the hijack route will propagate. The drawback of a forged origin hijack is that the IS path is a bit longer, so it will propagate less, but the attack will still be successful. In this case, for instance, still two autonomous systems, one and three, divert the traffic to the attacker. And unfortunately, the existing defenses, they actually poorly neutralize those forged origin hijacks. Okay, so RPK, PUSLOV, uh, they cannot detect forged origin hijacks because the origin is actually valid. BGPSEC, ASPA, uh, it will take a lot of time um, to be widely deployed. Um, Rod filters, they are often missing or inaccurate because we are st still seeing a lot of hijacks every day. And finally, uh, monitoring platforms such as Artemis and BGP Alerter, they are useful. They could detect them, but they could only detect them for the hijacks that pertain to the IS that deploy the system, okay? So it's kind of narrowly focused. Um, and the problem is that, as it was mentioned in the previous presentation, um, for judging hijacks, they are actively used by attackers, okay? So those are just the two examples that Doug mentioned before. Um, two attacks that targeted crypto exchange platforms and that were successful because in both cases the attacker managed to steal cryptocurrencies. Okay, so today uh, I want to introduce you a system which is called DFO uh, and it's a system that can detect uh, four drawing hijacks on the entire internet. Okay. So the outline of this presentation. First, I will show you what's the main challenge that we need to solve. Then I will uh, explain you DFO's inference pipeline. Then I will show that the inferences are accurate. And finally, I will show that DFO is up and running and that you can start to use it today. Okay, so the main challenge of DFO is to detect fake ice links. Okay, so why is this the main challenge? Because imagine we have the scenario that I described before. We have BGP vantage points, the, right, the one from recent route views, so we can see BGP routes. And, and then, um, when we look at the AS pass, we will see that five and seven here, they are actually directly connected. They appear directly connected when we look at the AS pass, right? Uh, and, but this is actually a fake link. This link does not exist. Five, seven, they are not directly connected. They are not pairing directly together, okay? And this is a sign of a forged origin hijack, okay? So why it's a sign that we are using in DFO to detect hijacks? Because an attacker, can actually hardly escape from creating a fake link when it launches the attack. Why is that? Because an attacker could prepend actually not just the valid origin uh, in the S pass, but could prepend an entire pass that exists in the topology. For instance, here the attacker could prepend six and seven, in which case the hijack route would have five, six, seven consecutively in the IS path, which is a path that exists in the topology, so there would be no fake link in this case. Uh, but the problem is that the IS path would then be longer and the hijack would propagate less. In this case, actually, none of the autonomous system would divert the traffic to the attacker, so the attack would be unsuccessful. Okay, so this is great. Let's focus on fake links. The problem though is that uh, we took um, BGP routes collected by RIS and route views, and we found that there are a lot of new links that appear every day, 166 in the median case. And some of them might be fake, but probably the vast majority of them are legitimate, okay? So the goal of, of DFO is to be able to know which one of those links are fake and which one are the real ones, the legitimate ones, okay? And to do that, we use an inference pipeline that I'm going to describe to you now. And really this inference pipeline is tailored to discriminate fake ice links from the real ones, okay? 
Okay, so the inference pipeline comprises three steps. First, default needs to uh, find new IS links. So to do that, we take the risk route views vantage points, we look at the IS path, we build the IS topology, we maintain it over time, and we look for new IS links. For instance, here we have three new IS links, um, and one of them is fake. Okay? Then for each new IS link, we compute feature values, and here we have four categories of features, okay? First, we have uh, the topological features. So here, I don't have the time to explain you in detail uh, how they work, but in essence, the intuition is that the IS topology follows a strong uh, hierarchical pattern, okay? There are a few autonomous systems at the top, many autonomous systems at the bottom, okay? So when a new link appears, if this link breaks that structure, it's a sign that it is a fake link, okay? For instance, if a stub AS suddenly become a um, central node in the topology, it's a sign that something weird is going on, okay? So we have different topological features that capture different sort of changes, um, and we use this feature in our inference. Then we have the peering DB features, okay? So here, default actually takes information from peering DB, such as the country, or which IXP uh, the two autonomous system they peer with, or in which facility they are present. And then we compare them, and if the two ACs that are, that became connected, they do not share any peering information, for instance, if they are in different countries, if they do not share any XP or any facility, it's a sign that they are not supposed to be directly connected and that the link is actually fake, okay? So we also use this information in the inference. Okay, then we have the IS path pattern feature. Here, default not only look at the new link, but it looks at the entire IS path that includes the new link, okay? And here we know that the ISCs, they are supposed to follow some business relationship that, that are typically uh, based on the Gara Wexford model. Um, so when we look at the IS path, we are supposed to see some patterns. For instance, when we look at the IS de Glee here on the Y axis, um, when we have a path between two steps, we are supposed to see that the degree increases and then decreases, right? That's the typical pattern that we are supposed to see. For a core two-step pass, we will see that the degree decreases because first we have the tire one, for instance, with a very high degree, and then we go to the step, so the degree decreases. So those two patterns, they are legitimate patterns, okay? However, if we see something like this, this is very weird. Um, this could typically happen when, when a stub hijacks a core AS. So for instance, in this case, the origin is the valid one, is the victim AS number, so it, it has a high degree because the victim is, is, is a core AS. And then the second AS um, has a very low degree, it's the attacker, it's a stub. And then we see a normal pattern, it increases, decreases. But overall, this pattern is very weird, it's very suspicious, and default uses this information as well in the inference. Um, and then we have a last feature, which is the bidirectionality feature. I'm not going into the detail here, but basically um, an attacker cannot fake both directions of a link. So if we see that, if we see that a new link is observed in both directions, it is very likely legitimate. An attacker cannot fake both directions because otherwise there would be a loop in the S path, and that's not possible. So we use this as well in our inference. Okay, actually those four features, they are, they are the key ingredient number one in the inference pipeline. Okay, why it's a key ingredient? Because they are complementary, okay? There are many attack scenarios that are possible in the internet, but here we ensure that regardless of the attack scenario, at least one of those features will be useful for the inference, okay? So they compensate each other, and they are complementary, and this is why it's a key ingredient in the inference pipeline. Okay, so then the last step is to infer hijacks. Okay, so here we actually follow uh, the typical approach that is used for link prediction uh, frameworks. 
Okay, so we sample a set of existing links and a set of links that do not exist. Okay, so those are the positive and the negative cases in a sense. Okay, we compute feature values for those sampled links and then we train an inference model. Here we just use a random forest. And then we use this random forest to make inferences. The problem, however, is that if we naively follow what is done in the literature, it will not work well in our case. Why it's not going to work well? Because again, the AS topology typically exhibits a very uh, strong hierarchical pattern with a few autonomous systems at the top, many steps at the bottom, okay? So when we randomly sample links, we will end up with many step-to-step -step link and only a few core-to-core -core links, okay? So just for this to be visually speaking, uh, what we did is we clustered the autonomous system in different categories based on their degree and their customer coincides, okay? And then we sampled randomly uh, a set of non-existent links, okay? And this is what you observe. We observe that 98% of the link that we sample, they are between two stub autonomous systems, okay? So this means that if we train default on those links, it will work very well for attack scenarios that involve two stubs, but it will perform very poorly for other attack scenarios, okay? So here is where we actually plug in our second key ingredient which is a balanced sampling scheme. We ensure to sample all types of links so that we cover all possible attack scenarios, okay? Okay, so now I will actually show you that uh, the inferences are in fact accurate in all attack scenarios. It's a bit tricky to evaluate default because uh, there is no grain truth, okay? Except the two cases that I mentioned before, we don't know any other uh, for George in hijack. So what we did is uh, we took, um, uh, we are, sorry, we artificially created for origin hijacks. So we took existing AS paths and we just added a new origin which creates a new AS link. Uh, and in some cases, the, the AS link that we create actually is not true, it exists in the topology, so it's a positive case. This AS, exist, this AS link already exists. In some cases, uh, we add a new link that actually does not exist in the topology, so this is a fake link. So it's a negative case. And, uh, and then we can use uh, those um, artificially created for Georgian hijacks to evaluate the true positive rate of default and the false positive rate of default, which are the two metrics that we usually use to evaluate a classification algorithm. Okay, so here are the results about the true positive rates. So on the x-axis, you have the type of the autonomous system of the victim, and on the y-axis, you have the type of the autonomous system of the attacker. And basically here, you can see that regardless of the attack scenario, so regardless of who is the attacker, who is the victim, there is always a high TPR, okay? Actually, the lowest TPR is 0.73, which is still quite high. In terms of false positive rates, um, again, uh, regardless of the attack scenario, so regardless of who is the attacker, who is the victim, the false positive rate is always very low. Actually, the maximum FPR is 0 0.15, which is still rather low. Okay, so finally, I will show you that DFO is up and running, useful for operators, and that you can actually start to use it today. Um, so to see whether um, DFO is actually useful for operators, we uh, were interested in the number of cases that it actually reports, okay? Why? Because if we use a very naive approach, such as just reporting all the new AS links that exist, which is a kind of the state of the art today, we would end up with many reported cases, okay? This is what we see on this graph. We would end up with thousands of cases reported every month, okay? And this is too many. We cannot manually investigate them, okay? But if we use default, you can see that we really greatly reduce this number. So now we have just a few tens of cases uh, that we need to investigate, and this is for the entire uh, internet, right? So this is, this is not a lot of uh, cases. Actually, I will demonstrate to you now that, um, uh, in fact, we can manually investigate those cases. 
uh, because Defo is, is up and running uh, at this URL, so you can, you can access the website. We provide uh, the paper because we will present this at NSDI in April. Uh, the presentation as well, the source code if you're interested. Um, and now to conclude, I, will, I would like to demonstrate to you that uh, Defo can be useful. And here I will actually use uh, the Apnix uh, prefix and ISN. Okay, so when you go uh, to the website, uh, we actually provide all the reported uh, suspicious cases, and you can uh, filter them. Okay, so for instance, what we did is we wanted only to see uh, the suspicious cases for which uh, the victim is uh, 4608, which is APNIX ASM, and then we took a, a large a period of time, so two years, 2022-2023. Okay, and here are the suspicious cases that we see, so there are only three suspicious cases, so not a lot, we could manually investigate them. That's what we did, we manually investigated, and we found that uh, this first suspicious case is actually very weird. Okay, so if you click on the line here, you can actually see the IS pass that is inferred as suspicious. And this IS pass, uh, sorry, not IS pass, this BGP route, <laughs> this BGP route that is suspicious. And if you look at this BGP route, uh, you can see it's for the APNIX prefix, uh, 103.0.0.0/16. You can see the IS pass. Uh, the origin is APNIX ISN. But if you look at the other IS number in this IS pass, uh, you will see something weird. Uh, actually, so you see that basically between the APNIX ASN and SecureBit, which is a BGP tunnel broker, uh, there is a stub autonomous system um, with not a lot of information on peering DB, so we don't really know what it does. But here it seems that it sort of provides transit between SecureBit and APNIX ASN, which doesn't really make sense. So I think in this case, for instance, is useful for an APNIX operator, so they could check this case, investigate, and take countermeasures if necessary. Okay, so that concludes uh, my presentation. So today I uh, presented you a DFO, a system that detects for origin hijacks. So DFO runs in a commodity server. It can detect hijacks on the entire internet. It is accurate in every attack scenario. It can detect past hijack. It also work in near real time detection but this feature is not activated yet. We will activate it for an SDI in April. <laughs> and finally, uh, DFO is robust against adversarial inputs. I didn't have the time to talk about that, but if you're interested, you can also look at the paper, which is on the website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. So there was uh, some suspicious announcement. On uh, yeah. Wow. Actually, we, we found many other uh, suspicious uh, cases, but I cannot show all of them. But the best is just that you put your ISN and see if there is something weird. <laughs> okay, so we can try by ourselves. Of course, of course, there is a, you can try by yourself. Any question, comment? Yes, please. State your name and your affiliation, please. I can do that. Hi, this is Robert from Drive and CC. Um, maybe only for the educational value. So you said you can find events that happened or are happening to your network, you know, active attack or so and then you take countermeasures. So suppose that I'm an operator. What do I do? What are the countermeasures? Uh, well, I guess it depends on the case. Uh, I think you can advertise more specific prefixes, for instance, or um, that's one option. Uh, I think this, is, this goes a bit outside of this word specifically. Um, yeah, so I guess it depends on the case. So you investigate. First of all, you check if the traffic was indeed uh, diverted to the attacker or not, because sometimes maybe it might be a misconfiguration. For instance, in the case that I showed, it could be a misconfiguration, in which case um, perhaps uh, I think that, what's up, that what happened in this case is that the route didn't propagate further because probably SecureBit filtered that route. So in this case, you can maybe just send an email to uh, the possible AS that did a misconfiguration. You just tell him to fix the Notify the attacker that right? I see them, right? If, if, the, if uh, the hijack actually diverted the traffic and, uh, and it is a, an attack, a malicious attack, then, uh, then you have to take more uh, like strong countermeasure, advertising more specific prefixes, 
uh, making sure that the filters are accurate, contacting your provider to make sure that the filters are accurate, things like this. Um, but again, it right. depends on the... Right, thank you. The um, then the other question is, what is the relation between TIFO and um, BGP SAC and or um, ASPA? So in the future, let's assume that at least one of those will be widely deployed. Is that going to be more useful for this work, or this work is going to be more useful for the deployment of ASPA and, and if sec? if ASPA or BGP sec are fully deployed, I don't think you need this anymore. <laughs> I guess that's good news. <laughs> that's well because there is this big if, right? And I think we are far from being there. So what will probably happen in the in the near future is that we will have a transition towards BGP sec of, of and ASPA. So we will have a sort of a partial deployment. So when we can use ASPA for some of the links, we might be able to use it because the operator, they, they are using it. So if we can use it, we should use ASPA because ASPA is, uh, and BGPSEC, they are crypto cryptographically based, so it's deterministic, so we can be sure that there is no false positive, no false negative. So um, we, should, we should use them, but if we cannot use them, then it's, it's an alternative. We can fall back to a, a, a probabilistic uh, techniques such as default. Uh, so that's how I would see uh, I would see it in the future. Thank you. Hi, Thomas. Uh, I'm Babel uh, from Hatsplatten Institute in Germany. And uh, so my question is, um, how much does this actually help solve the problem, or does it actually shift the problem from one place to an to another? Because if you if you consider the fact that you are assuming that the inference model is benign, right? If I were an attacker, and if the system is deployed, I would actually spend all my energy into poisoning your inference model itself, so that your model cannot detect attacks, right? So yeah. uh, while it's a very good academic exercise, I'm just wondering, don't you think it would be better time investment into uh, deploying BGP sec instead? Well, so, uh, so first of all, I think you were mentioning possible adversarial inputs, and this is a very good point. Uh, actually, if you look at the paper, we have a section about adversarial inputs, and I didn't really go into the detail because I only had 20 minutes, but uh, each part of our algorithm is, um, is designed to prevent uh, adversarial inputs. Of course, it's not bulletproof, and probably you can find cases in which you can maybe still trick the system, right? But uh, originally, we, we, we had this in mind, so we tried to, uh, to, to, to be robust against uh, adversarial inputs. Um, so now, why is it useful? Well, it is useful, first of all, because you can, get, you can quickly see whether you are being under attack or not. It is also useful to go back in the past, in the history, and check, oh, did, because now we only know about two forgeries hijacks, you know, that's what, only what we have in the news so far. Maybe there are more that happened in the past and we don't know. Maybe those two are the only one that happened. Maybe there are like 10, 20, 100 other attacks that we just don't know about them. So now with DFO, we can go back to the history and check and study them. Uh, I mean, I'm from the research uh, side, so this is useful for researchers, for instance, maybe not for operators, but at least for researchers, it gives us some meat. Uh, so that can be useful for this. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, I think there is still more to do. That's the first step. Of course, now we need to improve the system even more. I think there is still room for improvement. And one option clearly is to go toward uh, looking at the data traffic as well, combining the two. And that will, be make, that will make the system even more robust, actually. Yeah. Uh, good morning to all. Um, I am Zahir from Sri Lanka. So may, could you please explain me what's the mechanism used for the detections? So is it like a machine learning algorithm or, or kind of? It's a, it's a kind of, uh, in fact, machine learning algorithm, but it's not crazy machine learning. There is no neural network, deep learning, blah, blah, blah. It's a random forest, so it's very basic. Um, uh, but what matters in this machine learning part is our sampling, right? It's the key ingredient number two. This is the key part. Then the machine learning model that you use, it doesn't really matter. You can use a, a tree, random forest, neural nets. That's not very really important. What matters is that we manage to tailor the learning parts so that it works well for detecting forgeries hijacks, right? So 
what i my question is is it one algorithm is enough for the detection so you without the accuracy yeah so if you are not using the separate separate algorithms you so mean if, if you are not using the the over sampling scheme yeah right? that's good yeah if you if you are not using the sampling scheme it will perform very well for you know attacks that involve two stubs yes. but it will perform very poorly for all other attack scenarios so if you just compute a true positive rate uh, it will be very low so i can maybe go back uh, uh, here for instance it will be very high for step to step so on the top left corner we will be close to one the best possible score but for all the other cases it will be very low okay so this is if you just apply existing algorithm that exists in the literature, that's what you will see. Right. But if we use VFO, it works everywhere for every attack scenario. Thank you, interesting. No problem. Okay, no other questions. But uh, yeah, probably we will have a more partial hijack in the uh, internet. So for that, we need uh, more monitoring, and for that, we need a more vantage point. Because well, it is good at hiding, right? I guess, uh, <laughs> well, actually, we are working on that currently, so that's the next step. Okay. Having more touch points, yep. Okay. <laughs> cool, thank you. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. So, this concludes our APOPS uh, session today. Uh, but uh, before uh, concluding, uh, I have a, a several announcements. Again, uh, we have a writing talk session on this Friday, so the submission is still open. So you have uh, some idea or a uh, story uh, to be shared uh, for this community, like a five minutes talk. Uh, please submit your uh, slide to the, the Apricot website. And also uh, we have an um, experimental uh, Wi-Fi network here, uh, Apricot high from V6 only. It's a V6 only. And uh, you are, if your client uh, support on the V6 only network, uh, like uh, iOS or, or uh, Mac OS, uh, your uh, computer automatically configure uh, extra uh, functionality on your interface. It's interesting to see. So if we want to try uh, Apricot and Basics only network, it has the uh, same SSID, uh, same uh, password as a wireless. So you can connect to this experimental uh, Wi-Fi environment as well. And one more, uh, we have a peering uh, meetup uh, somewhere the, uh, in this floor, uh, Gary Wang, I guess, Philip. <laughs> so we have the room for the uh, peering Gary Wang is over there. So if uh, you have an appointment with your partner, uh, it's over there. So that's all from my side. Uh, thank you for joining us today and see you next time. Thank you very much. A little nonsense is what I need. Now if you wanna get the best of me